All right, let's start with the psalm. So we're in Psalm 49, Brad. There it is, man. Brad was like, what psalm are you in? And I was like, I forgot. I don't know. All right, we're in Psalm 49. Now he has it back there. And if you'll please stand. Uh, we stand in honor and reverence of the word of God as we, as we read the first uh, scripture together. We're in... Actually, you know what? I'm going to change it right now on Brad. We're going to Psalm 46 instead. <laughs> I'm looking at this. I'm like, you know what? I'd rather do that one. We're in Psalm 46. This is what pastors, when they excuse themselves for going off track, they call being led by the Spirit. All right, so here we are in Psalm 46. It says this, God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its waters roar and foams and the mountains quake with its turmoil, there is a river that streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple. The earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come see the works of the Lord who brings the devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears to pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. Hear this passage, church. Stop fighting and know that I am God exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. You may be seated, and let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we gather in your name as Surprise Christian Church this morning, I would just ask, God, that you would show us your grace and your kindness this morning, that as we walk through this passage in Acts, that we would grow deeper in our trust and our faith of you, Lord, that as we see so many challenges, God, that happens every election season here in our context, but God, as we see the challenges that happen around the world, whether it be wars or, um, you know, wars in Russia and Ukraine or with Israel and the various things happening there, Lord, we, we feel that pressure start to mount. We feel that anxiety start to mount. We feel that fear start to mount about the way the world is. Lord, help us to trust and to know, God, that you reign, that you are on the throne. God, that you cause wars to cease, that if it be your will, this very day, Lord, as we're praying, these wars would stop, Lord. But we just ask, God, for your grace for us, God, that we'd be a praying people, that we would seek that out, Lord, but that we'd be a people that honor you in our daily lives, no matter what we, we fear or experience or have anxieties about, but that you would be our refuge. God, you're an awesome God. Pray this all in the name of Jesus, name above all names. Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead and go to Acts chapter 18. If you haven't been with us, we've been going through a series verse by verse through the book of Acts. Uh, we've gone on quite the journey together. Um, at this point, we are seeing Paul run into a number of uh, opportunities to preach the gospel, but also running into a number of conflicts, as we've kind of seen around uh, along the way through Acts. And we saw last week in particular, we were looking at Paul preaching a sermon in Athens, right? And we, we took a look very closely at, an, at a sermon that was directed towards Gentiles as opposed to one, as we have seen along the way, more directed towards the Jewish people. And so we talked about how Paul is combating the philosophies of his time, and we spent a little time combating some philosophies of our own, if you remember. All right, we're going to be doing something a little different this Sunday. Uh, Paul is going to be continuing his ministry, but again, we run into a familiar conflict with the Jewish people. However, what I want you to pay very close attention to in this sermon is what method Paul uses to bring the gospel to the people he's talking to, all right? What method is Paul using? Because I think as we walk through this together, what we're going to see is a deeply challenging passage for us in the way at times in our culture, in our times, we present the gospel, all right? Because I think sometimes the way we present the gospel actually comes into conflict with the way the apostles and prophets presented the gospel. And I want to show that to you, all right? So stick with me through this passage today. There's going to be some historical details that I want to give you, uh, but ultimately we're going to try to hone in on Paul's method, all right? So we're in Acts chapter 18. I'm going to read the whole passage. We're going to go uh, 1 through 17 this morning, and then I'll go verse by verse, and we'll walk through it. It says this. After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. 
When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles, the nations. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship gods in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if there was a matter of wrongdoing or of a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal. And they all see Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Galileo. All right? We get lots of names here, all right? We've got lots of city names. We've got lots of people names, all right? But what we're going to see as we walk through this together is this actually helps us understand something that's a beautiful truth about Scripture, all right? And we spent a few weeks talking about uh, other worldviews, other philosophies, other religions. We've talked about why Jesus is better than those things. One of those things that differentiates Christianity from these other faiths is that there is a historical reality to the claims of the Gospels and of Acts and the other letters in the New Testament, all right? That this wasn't just some made-up story, but it happens in a real place at a real time with real people, real leaders. And so we catch these names in these cities and these towns and we go, oh, right, as we're reading, I don't want to look all that up. But what it does is it helps us understand that this is a historical event. This is not something made up for the purpose of communicating some myth, right? It is something that is in history, all right? But we got to spend some time walking through because it'll help us understand a little deeper what's going on. So we're in verse one, we're going to Go verse by verse back through it, and we'll explain. So it says this. So after Paul, he left Athens, and he went to Corinth. And there he finds a Jew, okay, Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And why? Because this guy named Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome, and Paul came to them. So we learn from a non-Christian author, a historian named Suetonius, all right, that this event, what had happened was the Roman government had started to notice some tension in the Jewish community that was leading to some revolts. Have we not seen that as we've walked through Acts? <laughs> All right. Paul's preaching, right? He's preaching about Christ. And what happens? He's been stoned, right? He's been dragged before judges. He's been dragged before tribunals. It's happened over and over again. And whole cities have been brought into an uproar. Well, Suetonius tells us that, that the reason Claudius passes this rule that the Jews need to get out of Rome is because they're talking about this guy named Crestus, all right? And what actually happens is Claudius is misquoting, okay? He's misquoting the Greek for the word for Christ, all right? So we learn in history from a non-Christian author at this time that Claudius was, was annoyed that these Jews were fighting over this Christ guy, all right, so that's part of our historical reality. And if it's about 50 AD, all right, so this is super early in the history of the church. It's a cool detail, is it not? All right, it's something that happens within true history. And so they tell the Jews to leave. Well, Priscilla and her husband Aquila are part of this group, all right, who has cast out of Rome. And so Paul comes to them, and they're both tent makers, all right, so they start working together to make a living. And in the midst of that, Paul is doing what he always does. He goes to the synagogue, and he reasons Okay, and he tries to, keyword, persuade both Jews and Greeks. So what did we learn about Paul's method? What does he do? He goes to do what? Reason? And what else? Persuade. All right, I want you to hold on to that. This is super important. Paul's method, when he goes, no matter what resistance he faces, and remember, he has been brought before not just Jewish tribunals, but last week, one of the nations, right? His life has been on the line everywhere he goes. And no matter the resistance he faces, no matter the threats of death he faces, no matter the hatred he faces, he still chooses to do what to convince people of the gospel? To reason and persuade. Very important. I want you to hold on to that. All right? So he's going and he's, he's doing this. Continuing in verse 
uh, 5 here. When Silas and Timothy arrived, he devotes himself to the preaching of the word, all right, to testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. They resist, as we've seen on many occasions, all right? And he leaves there to go to a house next door of a Gentile, all right? And we get introduced to this figure named Crispus, all right? Not Christmas, all right? Crispus, you know, quite the name. If you want to name your kids Crispus, you know, that's up to you. I mean, they'll learn a lot about enduring and suffering in the Lord when they go to school, but (laughs) it's quite the name. All right, so Crispus is the leader of the synagogue, though, so this is an important note. Crispus is not just anybody. He is the leader of the Jewish synagogue. And so the Jews are resisting, but is everybody resisting? No. In fact, some of their leaders, the leader of the synagogue, converts to Christ. Okay? And we actually get Crispus mentioned again in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. He's mentioned by Paul. You know, throw that verse up there. And he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. Later talking about the Corinthian church. We're not going to go there right now. All right? Hint, hint, we might be going there in a little bit as our next book for the church. But we're not going there right now. I thank God that I baptized none of you, Paul says, because there's this conflict in the church, except who? Crispus, there he is again, all right? So this is the guy that Paul baptizes personally, all right? And that's a rare occasion. But he baptizes this man personally. So he's a very important person in Paul's eyes, and that makes sense. And then we get this weird verse, okay? Verse 9 through 11. Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. Now up to this point, have we known Paul to be a guy that's afraid? Nope. Okay. It's kind of, it feels kind of strange, isn't it? But what we learn is something that we might not see externally in Acts, but that whole time has been going on internally for Paul. Think of all that he's been through, right? Again, the persecutions, the trial after trial after trial after trial, okay? The resistance that he's experienced, his life constantly on the line. You and I, I think, if we were honest, if we were in the same situation, we'd be a little what? Afraid. All right? And so God, even though Paul speaks so boldly, that fear is still there and God comforts him. Hey, not right now. Don't be afraid. I've got many people in the city. And then Paul stays there. So Paul gets to rest for a little bit. That's pretty cool. He, like, he stays there for a year and a half. All right? He's safe and he gets to rest. And God encourages him. And then we get another weird passage here at the end. Now, we've seen Paul's method for the gospel. I want you to tune into the, the Jewish people's method, Paul's opponent's method for stopping the gospel. All right? That's going to be what we learn from this verse. So going again, it says, While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship gods in a way contrary to the law. And as Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If we're a matter of wrongdoing or a serious crime, it'd be reasonable for me to deal with this. But if these are questions about words, names, your own law, judge for yourselves, basically, right? And then he drives them from the tribunal, and then we get this random <laughs> passage they all see Sosthenes, another leader of the synagogue, and they do what to him? All right, they beat the poor guy. I don't know why, but they beat him in front of the tribunal. All right, but none of these things mattered to Galileo. It seems like the Romans get upset with the Jews, so they take the leader of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the tribunal. A little lesson to be learned there. Just because you're experiencing persecution doesn't mean that you are doing the thing that's honoring to God. All right? We see this leader of the synagogue. He's getting beat in front of the tribunal. He's experiencing religious persecution, but not for Christ, right? You can suffer, right, in religious persecution and not be honoring to Christ, not live a life honoring to Christ, all right? So don't take it as an affirmation always of your faith that you're doing what's right because people resist you. That may not be true, all right? But what we see here is he gets beat, and then guess what? This is a cool little note. He gets mentioned again also in 1 Corinthians, believe it or not. 1 Corinthians, we learn in... The very first verse of chapter 1, it's going to be up here. Paul called as an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by God's will. And who? Sosthenes, our brother. So we not just have one Jewish leader of the synagogue, but this next Jewish leader of the synagogue who replaces the previous one gets beaten in front of the tribunal and then becomes what? A Christian, all right? So Paul's making headways with these leaders of the synagogue. But I want you to notice more specifically. And, And real quick, actually, I want to show you this. All right, I have to show you this. This is a picture. All right, of what's called the Bema Seat. This is where this event's taking place. All right, so this still exists today um, in Corinth, and you'll see it says Bema right there in that little sign. Um, and there, there's another picture of the back of it there. Um, kind of show you how this works. Basically, the Roman consul would have stood on this 
platform here above the people, and everybody would have been in those fields all around there. And so what had happened was, for whatever reason, they viewed the Jews as a problem. They grab Sosthenes, they throw him on the ground right in front of this tribunal, and that's where they, they beat him in front of this place. So again, a historical reality. I just wanted to show this so you have that in your mind's eye. You know, sometimes when we read these stories, like, what's going on? Uh, but you can kind of picture it. it's an open, open place there. Um, but that's, that's what it looks like. All right, that being said, I want to show you something that is different from Paul's method. What do these religious leaders, these Jewish people, what do they do in resistance to the gospel? They're not trying to reason and persuade. Instead, they do what? They attack, right, and cause violence. What's the other thing you notice? What else do they use? Not persuasion, but what? Force. Whose force? Rome's, right? Rome's. So the Jewish people, they, they're in resistance to the mission of Paul, they're not trying to debate Paul. They're not trying to persuade Paul. What are they trying to do? Either kill him or attack him. And how are they going to do it? By the force of government. Okay? By the force of government. That's their goal. If we can use Rome, then Rome can, can act it out for us. Now, has this happened before? All right, let's go all the way back. Jesus, yes, that's where we start. We're in church, right? Where do we start with Jesus? All right. Religious leaders, how did they kill Jesus? Did they just decide to crucify him himself? What did they do? Yes, that's right. They bring him before the Roman government, before Pilate. They get him condemned that way, and they have the Romans crucify him. Crucifixion was not a Jewish method of killing, okay? It was a Roman method of killing. So we've seen this happen before. The Jewish people resist in this instance with Christ, and they use the government as an act and tool of force, okay, to kill Christ and remove him from the issue. And then we see this over and over and over again. Has Paul been brought before governing officials in Acts to this point? Not just once, not just twice, three times, four, okay? It has happened over and over and over again. And we see the exact same thing happening here. And guess what? It's going to happen again. Spoiler alert. All right, we're not even to the end of that occurring. But I want you to notice the difference. Paul, as he's spreading the gospel, does what? He reasons and persuades. His opposition does what? Attack and imprison. Attack and put before tribunal. Attack and use the government as a tool or a weapon. Two different methods. All right? So let's get into our lessons for disciples for today. Because I want to spend almost all my time here. I want you to hear this first one. The gospel spreads and lives are changed through what? Reason and persuasion. All right, Christians? This is our method. As Christians, we believe that the way to convince people of the gospel is through reason and persuasion. Now, I have a simple question for you. Have Christians always followed that method? Okay. And we've talked about this before, Christless Christianity. Remember, we spent some time acknowledging that. But there has been several times, of course, in the long history of the church, where humans who have taken upon the name of Christ to spread the gospel do not try to use reason and persuasion, but use what? Violence, imprisonment, murder, okay? I think of one of the most egregious ones that seemingly, I don't know about you guys, I'm in weird circles on my social media, so I get stuff that probably no one else gets through the algorithm, all right? But I've been getting fed a lot of stuff. Um, we're talking extensively about this. I'm not sure if you've heard of the movement called Christian nationalism before, but we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. But I get a lot of feedback from there, and there's been an uprising that the Crusades were actually a good thing, okay? And we've been told wrong by our history teachers. We've been told wrong by the, you know, ethereal evil force out there that pushes things into schools, that the Crusades were really, really bad. But in reality, the Crusades were great, okay? So this is just propping up again. I just want to say something to you, and very clearly, you should all know this, church. Outside of just reading history books, you should know this and know this well. There is nothing about the Crusades, all right, that's honoring to Christ, nothing, all right? And you see that when you actually follow the actual reality. For example, one of the things the Crusaders did as they marched on their way to Jerusalem is they would go into every town, find the Jews, all right, and put them into forced conversion situations where either they would make them eat pork so they break their food dietary laws, confess Christ and force them to be baptized, or they would kill them. All right? Or they would kill their family in front of them until they did. This was their method. What's the method? Is it reason and persuasion? What's the method? You believe or I kill you, right? That's it. Believe or I kill your family. All right? And so Christians have certainly taken this method on in the past. But it's not the method that Paul preaches. It's not the method that Christ gives us. 
Did Christ spread his message of truth and the gospel through force and violence or through reason and persuasion? Should be pretty obvious, yes? But what happens is, as people resist the preaching of the gospel, there becomes a temptation that in order for the gospel to spread, we must reach out with force to do what we can to stop the growing tide of evil. All right? This is where it motivated the crusades. To stop the growing tide of evil, we've got to pick up the sword. All right? To keep the gospel alive. To preserve Christianity. I want you to think about this, though. Has anyone's life truly meaningfully been changed by Christ who was put into a situation where they were forced to believe? As Christians who know the gospel, right? Would you ever obey Christ and his commandments on your own? No, right? We know that about us because of sin. Would you ever obey the law of the Old Testament on your own? No, you wouldn't because of sin, right? Without the Holy Spirit, this is the lesson through Israel, right? Without the Holy Spirit, the Israelites kept falling into these cycles of disobedience, right? And God's judgment, disobedience, God's judgment. Why? Well, God tells us clearly in the prophets because their heart had not been circumcised, right? Their heart had not been changed. When Jesus goes around and he's preaching, the thing he rebukes the Pharisees over and over again is what? They're on the outside, they follow the law, but on the inside, what's the problem? Okay? They don't know God. And they don't want to honor God. They're using the law for other purposes, to look righteous, right? But Jesus goes back and says, I know your heart. So in order to be a Christian truly, where does that happen? Does that happen in the context of the physical? You've been baptized, you've taken communion, you're in the church. Does that make you a Christian? No, what makes you a Christian? Faith in the risen Lord, right? That's what makes us Christians. Can you force someone into that? So how can you get someone to that point? You have to do what? Use reason and persuasion, right? So even if we were able to force convert people, they would not actually truly be converted to Christ, right? They would be forced to believe. I lay this out here, all right, for a purpose, and we're going to get a little deeper into this. I told you I'd poke and prod you last week. I'm going to poke and prod you this week too, all right? But I want you to have that in your mind's eye because ultimately what we do as Christians, what our goal is, is to Use reason and persuasion. Convince people of the truth of the gospel so their lives are changed. Something we know to be true, and this isn't my quote, all right, but I just, I love it, all right? I don't know where it came from, so I'm just saying it's not my quote so you know that I'm not being deceptive, but I'm super creative. I'm the least creative person you'll ever meet, all right? But this is something I heard, and I think it's absolutely true. We know as Christians that your direction follows your affection. Let me say it again. Your direction follows your affection. You might also say your life follows your love, all right? Your life follows your love. And Jesus would say, where your treasure is, what? There your heart is also, okay? So as we live our lives, how you know that you love Christ, what does he say? If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. What we know to be true about the gospel is as we receive Christ by grace, the Holy Spirit transforms our heart and we genuinely desire to obey God. That's what God does with us, right? He teaches us not by force, not by saying you must obey these laws or else, but he teaches us internally and transforms us internally, right? That we can actually obey the law, that we'd actually seek God, that we'd actually love God. That's God's work. That's what he does. And we know the direction of our life if we're following, you know, nonsense, what's going to be produced in our life? Nonsense, right? But if our love is for Christ, what's going to be produced in our life? The good things God wants, fruits of the Spirit, right? We all know this. And so I want that principle in your mind because here's my second lesson for disciples. We see the first method, Paul's method. But the enemy does what? He tries to stop the gospel through violence and imprisonment. All right? So so Paul's method, persuasion. The devil's method, violence and imprisonment, all right? This is what the devil uses. Now, here's why I bring this up, church. And this is where I really want to just speak clearly and from the heart as best I can. I have seen over the last, I want to say two years or so, um, a great movement growing in the church of what is called, and I want to introduce this to you, Christian nationalism, all right? Christian nationalism. Now, you might not be familiar with the term, but you're certainly familiar with the theology because it it invades all sorts of areas of our lives, whether we realize it or not. 
the basic idea is that the best form of government that we could have is one that is distinctly Christian, all right? And that whether the people want it or not, whether the community wants it or not, we force Christian principles and laws upon them, all right? Because that is what is ultimately honoring to God. Here's the mistake we're making, church, when we do that. We're making the mistake in method. We think that by force, the gospel can spread. And that is a mistake. It cannot spread by force, right? Where I see this in particular, I want to give you an example, all right? And just stick with me. Don't be offended until I finish. Then you can be offended and be mad, all right? That's totally fine. But I just want to give you this as an example. One argument I've seen a lot is around the idea of prayer in schools, okay? And the Ten Commandments being put up on school walls. I've seen that one in particular for some reason recently. That the best way for us to change our nation and change the values of the youth as they come up is to put the Ten Commandments back in schools, put prayer back in schools. That's how we're going to do it. That's how we're going to bring revival into our country. Here's the problem with that, again. We have lost sight of what? The gospel. All right? Did the Ten Commandments convert you to Christ? No. no, they did not. What does Paul say about the law? The law is there for what? To increase transgression so that we would know that we are sinners. That's what the law is there for. All right? And yet, for some reason, it's being thought of as the best method to raise our kids in the church, to force them to believe the Ten Commandments in schools, even if they are secular individuals. All right? Now, here's what I want to be clear on. I would love more than anything else for the Ten Commandments to be in schools all over the country. I would love more than anything else for prayers to be in schools all over the country, prayers to Christ, more than anything. But you want to know how I want to get there? Is that the people in those schools know Christ and therefore want the Ten Commandments in their schools. Yes? Yeah, you can clap if you want. I want the people, the students, the teachers to know Christ and therefore want to pray in their schools. You hear me, right? Will we ever get what we want, people transformed by the Holy Spirit, if we remove the aspect of persuasion and begin, whether they like it or not, you're going to have the Ten Commandments on your wall? Is that going to spread the gospel effectively? I I really want you to think, church. And yet, a lot of our hopes as Christians have been tied so deeply into our governance in this country that we have forgotten the real methods of Christ in Scripture. The, the primary platform, and I, this is not about who to vote for or not to vote for. I want you, I am the least educated person you will ever ask about politics. I know nothing about roads and infrastructure. I know nothing about economies and how they should work. I know nothing about foreign policy or anything else. You must be educated on those things and seek those things out. This is not political advice. This is noting how the Christian faith has been co-opted for the purpose of elections. All right, That we have come to believe that for whatever reason, our best hope of revival in this country is going to come through who's elected into governance. My friends, let me just say this clearly. We are opting out and taking a cop-out, an easy solution, so that we don't actually have to follow Christ in the way he wants to spread the gospel. Here's why I say that. If you look at the culture and you say, man, they have gone away from Christ. You want to know when that happened? It didn't happen last election season. You want to know when that happened? It happened 18 years ago in your homes. What do I mean? When you were raising your kids 18 years ago, right? When they became adults, now they can vote. Yes, that's when it happened. It didn't happen by election. If you look at our country and you say, man, the, the moral fabric of our country has eroded and it's, it's just chaos and we've got to restore Christian values to our country. If you, if you believe that, that didn't happen because we have these evil governors who have destroyed Christianity. That happened because we have parents who neglected their children and teaching them the gospel, right? We have grandparents who've neglected their grandkids and raising them in the gospel and teaching them the truth. There was a lie that that persuaded people for generations. I just need to let my kids do what they want and decide for themselves. And listen, this is the other end of that. You can't force your kids to believe the gospel. But we have an obligation before Christ to teach them the gospel, don't we? If you have an obligation before Christ to spread the gospel to your neighbors, how much more to your own children, right? And yet there was a lie in previous generations. Well, we just got to let them decide for themselves. That's like saying, hey, I want the wolves to raise my kids and hope that they come to Christ. All right? This is not the truth. This is not the truth. Throughout the entirety of Scripture, God emphasizes over and over again, tell your kids, all right, along the path, along the way, teach them Scripture, teach them the Word, teach them to praise, teach them to worship, right? This is our obligation as parents. 
You want to know where the country fell apart? If we think of that, ethics, and it fell apart in our homes, not in our government first. And so we see this. We recognize it. Okay, the, the culture is what they call a post-Christian culture, right? It's gone away from Christ. And we're reaching out for a solution. And I think we're reaching out for a solution because we're afraid of persecution. All right? And so we're trying to reach out for a solution and say, man, if we just shove Trump in there, he's going to solve it all for us. And what we've done is we've abandoned our call for something easy. What's easy is writing down the candidate you want to vote for. That's easy. They make it super easy nowadays, right? You don't even have to leave your home. You can just write it, send it in the mail, all right? That is easy. You know what's much harder? To disciple your children. It's much harder. It's much harder to disciple not just your kids, but strangers, right? People in the church. You see, because this is the other aspect that we neglected. Over the last 20 years, church attendance has done what? Right? And we look at that and we say, wow, you know, our culture's just given up on Christ. But the truth is we've stopped making church even important at all. Not just for our kids, but in general. Right? I remember many pastors saying to me, you know, as you're preaching, make sure you let people know, like if they have games or they have sports, they have other things going on, just tell them, it's all right, miss church, no big deal, right? It's always next week. Nonsense, right? Nonsense. We need the fellowship. We need to be gathering. We need the scripture. We need the word. We need to be discipled. So where the culture has been lost is not in the ballot box. It's been lost in our homes. It's been lost in our churches. And it's because we've lost the gospel. So instead of doing the long work of reason and persuasion, we've decided to use force. Out of fear, we decided the best way is for the government to implement these policies. Our country will never change. The only thing you will do, the only thing you will accomplish, is to inflame things even worse. And don't we all see that very obviously? All right? We've had two different administrations in the last eight years. Has the gospel been spread in our country? Has revival occurred? Right? So that should tell you, shouldn't it? That if I use that method, the only thing that's going to happen is it'll get worse. It'll get angrier. It'll get more violent. And violence will be returned for violence until everything falls apart. You want revival. It begins with believing the gospel yourself teaching your kids to believe the gospel, getting in church to tell other people the gospel, and then more importantly than all of those things, all well, those things are foundational, telling your neighbors the gospel. Through what method? Reason and persuasion. Reason and persuasion. And then if we do that, you know what I would hope to see? And I think this is the fundamental problem, and I hope you hear me. The fundamental problem is we've given up trusting the Holy Spirit. I want you to think for a moment. You know, I use the examples of the schools for a second. How many of you in your heart said, Drew, I get that you're saying, man, I would love for kids to pray. I would love for kids to have the Ten Commandments, but I want it to be because they know the gospel. How many of you immediately in your mind went, well, that'll never happen? That'll never happen. So we, we better do it in other ways because, Drew, your way is never going to happen. You're never going to convince the reason and persuasion such to the point that the gospel will spread that secular schools begin to want to pray. That'll never happen, Drew. Does that not show that we trust ourselves more than we trust the Spirit of God to work? that we've taken the methods of persuasion that he's given us and we've decided, well, that's not good enough. It'll take too long, right? It'll take too long and it may never even work out. So I'm gonna do it my way because my way is quicker. It's faster. It's easier. If I just tell them by law, by governance, that the Ten Commandments have to be in schools, then that solves the problem, <laughs> right? Your method won't work. And so the question is, do we actually trust the Holy Spirit enough to see these examples in Scripture and say, no matter what I face, I choose the way of the Apostle Paul. I choose the way of Christ. I choose to reason, to persuade, to preach the gospel. Do we choose that method or do we say, man, I'm afraid, so let me get up and fight back? Jesus promises, church, Jesus promises the disciples that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. There were many times in Rome where it looked like all hope was lost, where the Christians were being mass murdered in public, and yet the method never changed. You do not see examples in the early church in Rome of Christians taking up arms to fight the Roman government in hopes of spreading the gospel. You won't find it. What you will find is Christians giving up their lives in martyrdom because they choose Christ over this life, over anything else. 
We don't even have an ounce of that level of persecution, and yet already we reach for the weapon instead of for the scriptures. We must change our hearts, church. We must change our hearts. It begins with us. It begins with us. We must change our hearts that we, no matter how our governance goes, and I'm not saying it's not important, it could be awful, right? It could be awful. No matter how our governance goes, we will choose Christ. We must get in that mindset now. Because I just have this overwhelming feeling that if you're putting your hopes in this election in November, you are prepared to be horribly disappointed. And you are prepared to be horribly afraid for the next 10 years of your life. But if you choose Christ, perfect love casts out all fear, right? That as the Apostle Paul is comforted by God, don't worry. I have many people here. You might not see them, but I have them. So stay. That we would hear that comfort from God himself. Don't worry. As it happens, it will happen, but I am in control. And you will obey me. Do you hear me, church? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are an awesome God. Lord, I pray that we would see revival in this country, Lord. And I, would, I pray that the gospel would spread in such miraculous ways that there, no one could deny that it was you working, Lord. Lord, I see that already. I see huge movements of students on secular college campuses putting together prayer groups and scripture and, and worship. God, in mass droves. I see you working by, by your Holy Spirit, Lord. I see you moving and spreading the gospel. God, I would ask that you fill us with that hope and that courage and that faith to believe and trust that you will work in us, that you will work through us, that the gospel will spread as we preach it with reason and persuasion to our neighbors, to our friends, to our kids, to our coworkers. God, I pray for such a massive revival in this country that it would be a praise and worship to you, Lord, that our entire government would seek and desire to honor you, God. That there would be such an unbelievable revival in this country, God, that there would need, be no need to convince about this ethical issue or that one because everyone's heart would cry out for the Lord. We know you could do it. We know you're capable. God, but help us be your vessels, God, to accomplish that mission. Help us be your people, God, the instruments you use to sing the glorious song of the gospel. But God, still our hearts. God, as fears and anxieties grow about our country, about our kids, our grandkids, as anxieties and fears grow about persecution or imprisonment or whatever it might be, God, still our hearts. And let us not act out of fear, but out of love and truth. Let us not act out of violence, but self-sacrificial love. Let us not act out of force, but God, persuasion as you persuade us. God, you're an awesome God. Praise the name of Jesus. Name above all names. Amen.